All right, so we are going to show two short videos. And then, as I said, there's the list in your packets with the various maker spaces. Because in all reality, um, if you guys are looking to utilize or um, partner with someone on these creative solutions, realistically, you're going to partner with an existing maker space or a university in your area. Um, but it can be helpful just to know what what goes in, what's behind the scenes in the creation of that type of business. So pending our working internet, we will get our video going. Uh, Santa Clara. Um, it's basically a place where people come make things, uh, but it's also a great place for people to get together, use tools, uh, sometimes free of charge, sometimes not. Here's, some, uh, here's our website here for Benicia Makerspace. Um, so you're basically getting two things. You're getting Three things. You're getting a clubhouse. Yep, basically. You're getting clubhouse. instruction, mm -hmm. and you're getting access to tools access that you couldn't to afford to have at home. Yeah, a lot of the tools that we have in the makerspace are, you know, like big lathes, big CNC machines, right. uh, hydraulic presses, which are really popular wow. now, apparently, on wow. YouTube. Um, but you, you can't get access to those things. You can't even rent those things, usually, for the amount of money that it takes to buy a month's membership, certainly at our makerspace. So the first thing that now comes to mind is the liability issue. I mean, these are scary tools. People Absolutely. can hurt themselves badly. Right, and you do have to cover yourself for that. So, so you get liability insurance? Liability insurance, big time. Um, also, everybody, even though everyone says it doesn't hold up in a court of law, we do make everyone sign, sign a waiver, a waiver, yeah. a very detailed legal waiver, as well as agreements on how they will and won't use the tools. Okay. Um, so that's part of the. That's a good idea, agreement. even if it's not legal. Right. It kind of focuses them. It gets the mindset the of, hey, yeah. this could be dangerous. I yeah. need to maybe take a second thought about doing something on these machines before I actually, you know, are you a non dangle my tie over the lathe? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then you probably have to have. 24, I mean, supervision for every hour that you're open. You, right? you don't really. So the way we handle that is that we, it, like I said, every makerspace is different. What we do, though, is we say, uh, as part of your membership agreement, you can't use any tools you don't know how to use. Okay. And if you want to know how to use a tool, there's a mailing list. You just put a uh, question out there. Can someone show me how to use the you need to, I need the, a mentor. I need a mentor, somebody to come in and help me out. Right. Um, and we also offer beginner classes, which also accomplish the same task. So we offer beginner classes in welding, uh, metal shop, wood shop, 3D printing, CAD CAM design, things like that, to if get somebody, people started. If somebody wants to do this, is there like a template? Look at there's a Twit, uh, you're making the Twit logo. Oh yeah, actually that's uh, one of the things I brought in. So that's our, oh, you're burning our little it. laser etcher, that's and I actually neat. brought that with me. We were just doing that that's yesterday, cool. and then he that's came really out and cool. took some video of it. So, um, is there, should people be scared off by this liability mm -hmm. thing? No, I mean, not at all, not at all. Are there templates online? Is there documents, there legal are. documents? Absolutely, like if you go to spaces.makerspace.org, uh, I believe it's org or .com, um, you can actually download a Makerspace playbook. Ah. And this is what we use. It's not the only thing we use, but we use this to kind of get an idea. If you really have no idea where to start and you don't know anybody that can help you, um, download the playbook. It's really worth it. They just ask you to sign up with your name and email. Um, and they'll send you a copy, and it got all kinds of instructions in there from how do I get started, what are the best practices, what are the legal requirements, starting a nonprofit, um, if you're going to go that route. Um, so you don't have to be a nonprofit. You don't have to be a nonprofit. So I mean, if you look at Tech Shop, for example, they make um, money. They make money. They're a for profit yeah. organization. Fab Labs are typically yeah. for profit. Um, so you don't have to be nonprofit. We wanted to go nonprofit because we felt a need, this was a service to the community, right. right? It's something that we're opening up, and we want people to be able to donate. Um, there and, and, and encourage them deduction. to donate to get yeah. the tax deduction. Yeah. So in the U.S. you can do that. So we've had a lot of stuff donated. We've got a pile of stuff. I don't know if Anthony got it. Hopefully he didn't because it's a mess. But we've just got a pile of stuff um, sitting around that needs to be sorted from people donating computers. We got. Oh, but this uh, is a geek dream. Oh, it is. True. All those cabinets are filled with things oh, that we've taken man. apart, and and now our makers can reuse them. So we've got gears, we've got motors, we've got all kinds of stuff. We also stock some things like Arduinos and Raspberry Pis. Um, and we basically sell those, or, or we offer those to our members for an additional donation, I should say. One of the, th one of the keys, to, I think, to making this successful, as a lot of things like this, is getting an engaged mm -hmm. community of Absolutely. users, people coming every day, people committed to it, to helping out. How do you do that? Um, you know, you can reach out. There's a lot of good ways to reach out. Go to... Um, uh, town council meetings, for example, and uh -huh. just say you're interested in doing it. A lot of times that'll get picked up by the no local newspaper. Right. We did that on a number of occasions and it really helped. Do you need city government buy-in? Uh, you don't necessarily, but it helps. 
Uh, we've had a lot of help hurt. from our local government in trying to find a place. They were able to get us some recommendations or some local listings that we wouldn't have had access to otherwise of buildings for rent, for example. Uh, we actually got our very first funding from one of the uh, city commissions um, who had some money and they wanted to do some specific things around sustainability. And we stepped up to the plate and wrote a grant for them and said, oh, we'll do these things. Um, then they can, really see what an asset they the see what the result are. is yeah, absolutely yeah. absolutely what uh, who's on the hook for the rent I mean is, is there a <laughs> you have some sort of legal entity absolutely so one of the first things you want to do is start your own corporation okay. so in California we're incorporated on, under um, the state of California and then that's also the first step in applying for a nonprofit status right so you have to do that if you want to do the nonprofit route anyway so somebody's gonna put some money and energy in up front yep, was that right. you um, yeah it was me the town there was a group of five, about five of us that said look this is a perfect community we have a great arts community in Benicia we have an industrial park um, the the neighbor everyone's interested in learning and everything like that so we said you know we really need a makerspace this nice is the perfect town <laughs> Good yeah, no, look, look at that. <laughs> I, I think that that's uh, so important that you you didn't go it on your own no. you got a group of people who could help you absolutely uh, and, and you kind of bootstrap this up by adding interests it snowballs a little it bit, does it does and yeah. the biggest thing is you can't just sit back and say well we'll just wait for people to get interested in it right you have what to we actively did, you have to actively yeah. go out and just do something we we, right. we sat back for probably six to eight months trying to meeting and saying well what are we going to do how are we going to get funding what how are we going to do this and then finally we said look let's go to the community center and just do a workshop and we did several workshops on electronics we did workshops on gardening on how Smart. to do uh, hydroponics hydroponics and, stuff, and yeah. things and so we did Smart. all those things and then that built interest in our yeah. group as well and so before we knew it we had uh, you know 50 or 60 people on meetup that were really interested in helping us get started and now we've got over I think we're almost up to 500 uh, people on meetup these aren't members necessarily but they're just people that want to come to our public events and things like that some of this gear is so expensive it makes sense that there are going to be people who would want to use this yes. who would want to check you know I'm not going to buy a lathe but right. I might want one occasionally a CNC milling machine same thing that's right so it's a question of getting word out mm -hmm. having people discover it I think mm -hmm. they'll start using it as soon as they know it's there absolutely and we survey our users and our members especially um, to see what they're interested in getting you know what what are How we missing you get stuff so there's lots of ways um, if you check, uh, obviously, Craigslist and places like that, those are the obvious ones. But if you also check, this is where your local government, again, can come into play. If you have an economic development board that knows that there's a company going out of business, mm. you may be able to purchase their equipment that they would otherwise just send to a surplus equipment vendor. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. We found a local company, or semi-local, that, that was basically getting rid of all this equipment, the welders, the hydraulic press, some of the other stuff. And we said, if we pay you the same amount of money that you were going to give this to the surplus vendor for, will you let us have it? And they said, yeah, but you got to come pick it up. So we said, okay. Um, wow. They could have they could have donated it, but they were in a situation where they didn't need the tax write off. Right. Um, but we basically got all of this equipment um, for pennies on the dollar. This would be some sort of critical mass. You have to have a certain amount of equipment to get people interested. You in. do, and, and you, you can start there. with those things that people are most interested. Which Obviously, three D printers. Three D printers. Everyone wants to use three D. And printers. these are th these, like a lot of these parts are three D printed, right? That's right. Yep. Those yeah. are actually parts to our laser maze um, that oh, we three D printed. Cool. This is the mirror. That's the mirror. Yeah. And we needed a we needed a gimbal system, and so a couple of our members said, oh, "I bet we can design." that oh, that's and so neat. one guy designed this little um, uh, tongue and groove uh, mount here so you can actually take that out you can put you can mount this part oh, on neat. a stable structure and then you can take the mirror in and out or replace it with another component and then somebody else built this little gimbal system and a way to, to frame it and everything and it was really what really fun. ingenious what fun yep Oh, there's our laser maze sign. What else there. is popular? So 3D printers, that's a great way to start. And, and the good news is those can be inexpensive. They can be. At least when you get going. Yep. What's that? So this is part of our laser maze. I think this is oh, what this okay. is. Oh, okay, that's smoke. Yep. Okay. So there we go. Oh, so look at that. Typically, we actually built an 8 foot by 16 foot enclosure. And this is an exhibit that we bring out to um, our local mini maker fair. But we have also done it for grad night at the local high school. So this thing is set up in a huge room. And you actually have to crawl through the lasers without <laughs> tripping them. Like Tom Cruise. Like Tom Cruise. Oh, that's fun. And it's timed. So the, the clock starts counting as soon as it says go. And if you break a laser, <laughs> you lose a certain amount of time or adds a certain amount of time to your oh, overall Oh, this would be time. great for a senior class that's party. That's exactly and, what we yeah, used it for. Yeah. The, the seniors loved it. They oh, were challenging their friends yeah. and going together, of course. That was really popular. And this is, but it serves the community, but also raises awareness. Then there's some parents it that are going to know, oh, this exists. Yep. I think this is kind of the kind of thing you have to constantly kind of be promoting and, you do. And, you do. and getting uh, going. And, and it can have, be a great, I mean, you know, for anyone thinking about doing 
doing this, go to your local economic development board and tell them about the potential benefits that it brings to the city or town. Yes. Because new ideas are being formed in our makerspace all the time. And these are potential potential new businesses. And it may take a little while of preaching about it to get them to really buy off on that idea. But you can find plenty of examples online of people that have taken something to a Kickstarter that started in a makerspace. Right. I see you were cutting up rebar. Is that how you made this geodesic? So uh, I, I did not go? do this. This is one of our board members. Uh, oh, he's right back there, actually. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jim. Nice. <laughs> Jim's here. So this is actually Jim's project, um, and uh, it is he a geodesic ball. He are you a welder, Jim? Is that? No, I'm an engineer. He's an engineer, but he's you done. like making things, right? Yes. Don't let him fool you. He's a master engineer. And isn't this more fun to have in a space where other people are doing it than in your Absolutely. garage? You want to, It's kind of fun to do it with other Absolutely. people. Absolutely. I mean, we would have never take, probably tackled this, this the la laser, the laser maze, maze project so cool. without having other people to do it. I mean, I couldn't have done this by myself. What is that you um, just uh, were messing with? Is that ah, so that's a uh, break. It's called a metal break. And it's basically a, a big, heavy a bender. plate. It's got all those little plates there that yeah. you can line up with your metal piece. And as you push that bar forward, it actually bends the metal. And you can do it to pretty pretty accurate precision. So I think oh. I did like a 90 degree bend there. You have it's, a milling machine. Hard. This is this must be fun. People must love this. It's a CNC. Yeah, so we've got CNC. So this was just drilled out. This is a, just stock aluminum uh, uh, square bar. And so this was drilled out by one of our members. And then they CNC'd the, uh, the name of the company, right? Coast Steel so cool. on the top of it. And then they sold it at Venetia Mini Maker Fair. Wow. And donated the profits to the Makerspace. So it was really nice of them. What's the website? Website is BenetiaMakerspace.org. But like I said before, if you want to learn about how to do it yourself, uh, go to spaces.makerspaces.org um, and download that playbook. It's critically important. How old is the Venetia Makerspace? So we've actually been working on this for about three years now. But our space, physical space, really only opened about a year ago. We just had I'm our one-year anniversary. I mean, you really, this is an amazing space. And how many members do you have? So right now we're up to a little over 50 members. Um, we're looking to grow that to about 100. Um, so the outreach the continues to be a big Absolutely. Part and pe as people discover it, then they go back and tell their friends, hey, this is great. I took this welding class. Wow. It was awesome. Did you see that? Made in the German Democratic Republic. <laughs> Holy cow. That was from East Germany. This is an older CNC machine. Yeah, it's no not kidding. one of the newer ones, but it's, uh, That's awesome. it's very reliable. Ozzy made it. Oh, surprise, yeah. Surprise, surprise. Germans make great stuff. Yeah. And see, even, even the CNC machine, somebody donated the spindle for it. Um, so we were able to put that on there. A lot of the stuff, like that that uh, drill press right there, we found basically in the back of a, of a shop. It was sitting outside. It was all rusted. And one of our uh, board members said, hey, I'll go work on this. I'll clean it up and paint it. And now it's beautiful. And it works great. What a great hobby. So, again, you what can find thing. this type of equipment if you just look around a little bit and start asking questions in your neighborhood. Yeah. Very cool. BeniciaMakerspace.org. Dot org. Dot org. Aaron Newcomb, you know, we talk about this all the time. You always bring projects by. I'm really glad we could talk a little bit about how to do it. I would love I'll to see started. people doing this. All right, what'd you think? You guys ready to go use a CNC machine? I can do the chop saw and maybe the drill press. Anybody else remember using some of those tools? It's not just, you're shaking your head, Cindy. You had no shop. And yet you became an assistive technologist despite that. Oh, double home act. All right. I am going to refresh our other page and see if we can't get it to play for us. We're going to start it over. Cross. <laughs> So this is the Milwaukee Makerspace. The Milwaukee Makerspace is um, this entire building that allows members 24-7 access to every tool we have here. Um, the idea is to get makers and innovators together to both have an incubator um, and a skill development center, which lends itself perfectly to independent living skill development. Um, there's the social aspect where everyone here is a member there's no staff. We do have a board uh, staffed by our members, 
and all of the skill acquisition is member to member. So um, individuals can practice social skills in developing those relations and uh, acquiring new skills. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go see our laser cutters, our 3D printers, and then continue on throughout the facility. Imagine doing the difference between doing math with a piece of paper writing down the numbers versus having Elmo and he holds a dollar bill in his hand and that's how you learn math. More reinforcing that way. So what I have right now is just a piece of acrylic which is thin plastic. I'm going to go ahead and put it on the laser bed. There we go. So right now, a 30 watt laser is cutting into the acrylic and following my computer program. We take out our item and now we have a piece of rapid prototype plastic ready for use in a switch. So that was done in about uh, 77 seconds. So this is our 3D printer area. This is one of our most uh, popular areas and it highlights um, the power of collaboration in sharing this equipment. Um, it is rather cost prohibitive, but when a large group of people come together, work on an item together, and share time and funds, really anything's possible. And you can make uh, rapid prototypes fairly easily. The filaments that are used to print 3D material uh, vary in application. So this one is actually a flexible plastic. So this would be a great application for some AT here. Otherwise, we have high uh, threshold plastics that are very tough, yet very defined. And you can get extremely intricate with 3D printers, such as the skull here. Um, another application is uh, architects can go ahead and do a mock-up of a building. This one looks to be a cathedral. And you can do small design projects like this small box here. Right above me is actually an art installation done by one of the artists that uses our space. This was a proof of concept piece for a much larger installation that he plans to install in a public space soon. So this is our hack rack, another example of why collaborating together with a group of um, hackers and makers is important. Um, I can come over here and reach in and find something. Really anything you need to do a project, you can come over here, look, and probably find something. We ask that if you use something, you probably put something back or contribute back to the space in some way, just to keep the collaboration going. Our makerspace also um, includes a screen printing area. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity for advocacy. Um, you can print a t-shirt rather quickly once you make a screen of it. Um, this one was made utilizing the vinyl cutter and you can customize this rather quickly. T-shirt down, apply the ink, cure the ink, and a shirt is done in less than five minutes. So it can be uh, specific for every advocacy effort that you do. So this is the Milwaukee Makerspace Metal Shop area. We have a number of CNC machines which can mill away at metal. Uh, the metals area is a fantastic um, area for trade skill development as well as AT and uh, mobility device repair. If a part is um, no longer uh, able to be ordered, it is actually possible to completely fabricate on site right here using the CNC machines and stock metals. And then a fully functioning forge 
for um, casting and uh, metalworking. Throughout here, we can also continue that development of the metal products. We have metal finishing, a wide range of buffers, powder coating, um, as well as anodizing, which can really increase the longevity of a piece. And again, the collaborative nature of the makerspace is shown here. Um, we do have some stock materials that we can use, which is fantastic for rapid prototyping. And we also provide the gas. So sourcing of those materials is no longer a concern. And then the next spot we'll go to is the wood shop. The wood shop is easily our most uh, popular area and most heavily in use. It really shows the possibility to make adaptive controls. So if there is a dexterity concern, making a jig on a table saw where it's a sled and you can push the material forward is invaluable. So this is our component library where we have everything that we need to make any type of electronic computer parts, uh, electronic parts, diodes, transistors, integrated circuits, um, and it's all free to use, so you can do the prototyping on site. space or the other video that we had shared. No questions? Are you guys all ready to uh, go make stuff? Yes, go ahead. No, Cindy, do you want to answer that? No, it's not associated with the university, but of course, university folks are welcome. And I believe some folks from MATC have come over and done some fabrication there as well. Um, but the Milwaukee Makerspace is a completely independent uh, organization. They also sponsor what they call is the Maker Fair. It's part of the Harvest Festival every September. And we've actually exhibited there a couple of times. And if you have a chance, it's a free uh, afternoon and it's just wonderful. Thanks. All right, so we are going to transition to the part where you, oh, we've got another question. So the question is whether maker spaces um, in general are accessible for individuals with disabilities, and if not, can accommodations be made? Um, one of the challenges with these maker spaces um, that we have seen is that some of them are not accessible um, for maybe someone who's using a wheelchair um, or has other disabilities. So that is one reason we chose to do the video for this particular one. Um, I would think that some self-advocacy um, or support from, you know, an advocate would, I, you know, the maker's movement is, it's very closely aligned with that independent spirit. And so, you know, I think that they will work individually. You know, I can't speak for all of them. Um, but that would be my hope, that they would make, make things happen um, that they can. I don't know, Cindy, if you had anything on that. Because you've had some experience with the Milwaukee one. The Milwaukee one has a semi-adequate level of accessibility if you are walking. If you are um, a wheelchair user or a scooter user, no, it's not accessible. And it's also not covered by the ADA because it has no employees. 
So that's what that's one of the problems that a lot of maker spaces run into is because they're volunteer organizations and they don't have they don't have that 15 person threshold in order to comply with the ADA. Um, in Milwaukee, the space the only space that they could get was a building that was not optimally accessible, but it was one that they could afford based on the number of tenant you know number of people who were members. So they're working on it. But it definitely is not anything that can be mandated for accessibility. Unless, obviously, it's with a university or a school. Um, you know, in Eau Claire, we have one at UW Eau Claire. And then there's also um, a place called Artisan Forge, which is an, an artistic maker space that happens to do some other regular maker space. And they've done some assistive technology. And I have toured that pl that building, and because they were fortunate enough to have a very, very large space, they have much greater physical accessibility in that specific space because they could spread out. Um, so as Cindy said, it's going to depend on the, some of these are just a loose collaborative, and they're just grabbing whatever warehouse space that they can. So are there any other questions on that? All right, are you guys ready to think? and process and play around. All right. There's a variety of tools we're going to run through this afternoon. Um, so tomorrow's training, we have Therese Wilkham, and she's the director um, of the AT Act for New Hampshire. She's also the author of several books, and I'll explain all that tomorrow. Um, she is very energetic and very creative. So I thought that we should maybe get our creative juices going Wisconsin style, not quite as energetic, um, ahead of time so that you guys can kind of be thinking creatively when you're on the spot tomorrow when she hands you stuff and says make something. So, so think of me like the substitute teacher and then she's like the real teacher, you know, the real, art, the real artist. So I am not anywhere near on the creative end of the scale for much of anything. I'm not, I dreaded art class and I dreaded having to ever make things. So when I began my career at Center for Independent Living, it was a 10 county area working with all types of disabilities in the middle of nowhere, a lot of nowhere. Um, yes, there are some cities and towns, but a lot of that territory I covered was the middle of nowhere. And then I'd get out to set up a piece of technology for someone or look at something they already had. And I had to quickly up my creativity skills um, to try to problem solve on the fly. And one thing that developed out of that was in the trunk of my car, I had the Fix-It Kit. Um, some of you are familiar with that from working um, in collaboration with me over the years. It was basically all the things that I might pick up at a hardware store to have in my car to figure things out for that little old lady that lives in the middle of nowhere and the nearest store is an hour away. So what we I'm going to run through that fix-it kit list with you. It's also in your packet um, in, on the back side of the makerspace. But we're going to just talk about why and how we might use everyday objects um, to creatively solve access or to solve problems. Um, so on the table in front of you, you see a variety of, well, there's Play-Doh. Has anyone pick, pulled their Play-Doh Play -Doh out yet? No, all right. There might be a prize for creativity on that. Um, I learned a lesson yesterday. There are two times not to go to Walmart. One is the first day of school when they all get their pick list of things they have to have on day two. The other one is the first day that they're out of school in the summer. So I can just let you know those are the two primary days not to go to try to find Play-Doh at Walmart. But obviously I found it. Um, so I've got a couple different tasks that we're going to do. Um, and the first one, I'm going to come over to Cindy's table. So the first task is on your table, 
you have a piece of paper that has, on one side it's got a telephone, and then on the other side it has some um, controls for an oven. And I'm debating on whether to hand the little paint out because I have a feeling we would ruin tablecloths. I'm not sure, because I don't think I bought the right stuff because I'm not crafty. I think this isn't quick dry. So if you really feel you need it, let me know. Um, so basically, on the middle of your table, you've got some dots and some little blingy rhinestones. And I'm going to actually pass out a little some colored tape around the room as well. And I'd like you to take that telephone keypad. And I'm not going to give you any tips or tricks on this. You have someone that has trouble seeing. And they need to use that numbered keypad. So I'd like you to think about how you would use some of the tools on the table. And some of you is going to be a little easier than others. Danny. <laughs> so if anybody really wants to cheat, talk to Danny. But we're going to, I'd like you to give a sh try at marking so that someone who can't see very well can use that numbered keypad. So there are a variety of tools. Like I said, I'm going to hand out some colored tape as well to help you out. And then we'll talk a little more about that fix-it kit. I'm going to give you like just about five minutes. Are we all set and ready to share? All right. Well, before we share, um, I realize I didn't really go through kind of what was in my trunk of my car as my fix-it kit. Um, like I had shared, I put the list in there. I took take a couple things out that used to be in there that are no longer, really no longer necessary. And um, one of them was a old style, four-prong phone adapter. So honestly, there are still some rural homes where phones are, it's a four-prong, and then in order to get the duplex, you had to have an adapter. And so someday during the apocalypse, I'm going to have that adapter, and I'm going to be really popular. <laughs> All right. So on the list, we, and I'll just run through, generally, Obviously, scissors, and I learned that one of our interpreters carries scissors today. And then I handed mine over there. Don't let me leave them. So, but you needed a duplex, a jack for the phone. Um, I would probably add a DSL filter jack on there so that if you are in a rural area and they're using DSL for internet and you need to plug into that phone line, three prong elect electrical adapters, power strips electrical tape, both black and colors, because those are great for labeling, duct tape, reflective tape, anti-skid tape, Sharpies. I like the kit that has like 20 colors. Sandpaper, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Velcro, both the peel and stick, as well as the poly lock type that is very heavy duty, and interlocks, basically plastic interlock. It's very adhesive. But wire ties, flashlights, zip ties, plastic bags. You never know when you have to touch something that you don't have a glove for. Um, screwdrivers, various sizes, or I like the ones where you just flip the end from flat to Phillips. Thin wire, like you have on your table. S scissors work for that, but tin snips are good to have. Key rings in various sizes. Fishing line. No, not to go fishing. Can make it very easy to for make a zipper pull. We also I also we always had cleaning wipes. I still carry those. Alcohol wipes, scotch tape, note cards, so you can leave the instructions. And then I always use the gear ties, which are they're they're sort of like a rubber eye. They're similar to that blue stick that's on the table because they can be twisted and turned around for fastening things. So, and that's just a small sampling of the things that I would end up needing when I was on the road. Um, 
I still to this day enjoy wandering up and down the aisles of Menards and like thinking like what what could I use this for you know where you know I know there's gonna be a use for that somewhere um, so I enjoy doing that yes Nancy Mm-hmm. The Sharpies. Mm-hmm. Yep, paint, but yeah. Sharpies come in silver. I use a silver Sharpie. I think I have one. Uh, I think I have one in my bag. Silver Sharpie. <laughs> you need to spend more time in the office supply area. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. his daughter bought all the different colors, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, they're great. All right, so, Ashley. Oh, okay, that's right, that's, thank you. I almost forgot to give my example. All right, so, s before we get to you guys showing off all of your fancy designs, and notice I don't have bling dots on here. You know, those were just what I found yesterday at the store. So the phone on here has 12 memory buttons, so pre-programmed buttons to dial frequently called numbers. And I had a lady that had, she had 13 children, 13 grown children. One lived with her, so at least we didn't have to worry about what to do with number 13. Um, but she had a significant vision loss, and um, her memory was going a little bit, so we, we struggled with how, how to program the numbers in, what order, how is she going to remember which one is which. Um, we tried birth order, but then she also had favorites. And <laughs> it, it, re it really did get kind of complicated. And then I started to mark the buttons individually with a different texture for each one for her. And then I realized I ran out of things. You know, Velcro has two sides and then the tape, and then the bump, and then the bump dot fell off. So I ended up using different grits of sandpaper. So we used all the grits of sandpaper that I could find and glued little pieces on there so that each button did feel differently. Um, and it just helped lodge in her memory which child. We did decide on birth order. Um, she agreed that, I said, because what if they, they come over and they wonder why Johnny's at the top, but he was like the fifth born. They're all gonna know you like him better. So she agreed that we could do birth order. So so that's why the sandpaper's on there. And this is a true story, by the way. I don't think I could make that up. So does anyone would anyone like to show off their phone creativity? and maybe share what they did on that phone keypad. There's chocolate involved, Nancy, yes. All right, you gotta come up and bring it up. Yep, we're on film. Yeah. We are on film. She forgot about that part. All right. Uh, so one thing I wanted to keep I just want to ask, did anyone mark every button on their phone? Did anyone put something on each and every number? I know, you follow. Well, you aren't supposed to read the rules. I very rarely, rarely follow the rules. Right, boss? <laughs> uh, so I wanted to keep in mind, first of all, that somebody with a vision loss might be able to see one color better than another. So I put two different colors on there. And I also used one of the smaller bump dots. And then I put a thing of Play-Doh, which probably will fall off once hardened, but I was kind of simulating the uh, puff paint. But then I also folded up a piece of this sticky, fo uh, sticky sticker. I folded it up and put it underneath. So it's more, it's raised up a little more. There's your chocolate. There you go. All right. Did anyone want to share? Anyone else want to share what they did? Come on up. 
And nice to meet you in person, Eric. We've been corresponding quite a bit lately. I hadn't seen you yet. Now I can see you and run the other way. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So what I did was I, I wasn't sure like how specific the rules had to be. So as far as textures go, um, I put a bedazzle here on the number one up in the corner. Uh, a piece of tape with some of the foam on top of it for a little softer. Um, some Play-Doh on the nine, like Nancy mentioned, to represent puff paint. And then I have a paper tab um, up here on the three. Uh, but the other thing that I did as well, uh, like Nancy mentioned, was uh, the, you know, the level of vision loss where someone might still be able to see color. Um, it had four different of the stickers that I made into tabs on each of the phone buttons, as well as angle them in a way so that it's a different, um, uh, a different direction on each button. So this way you can feel around which, you know, which corner of the button it's on in rel um, relation to where the five is. So it'd be easier to figure out where you are. Very good. Have some chocolate. Thank you. All right. And he used the bedazzle. We normally use bump dots versus bedazzles. But now that I'm on to those, I mean, I don't know. All right. Um, so... Does anyone want to share their stove markings and how that went? You didn't get that far. All right. I think a few people did. All right. You want to come on up and share what you did? Now we know what a DVR counselor can do. I don't know if I want to be a representative for my entire craft, but um, I'll just talk about my stove for a little bit. I We decided in our group that the areas of the stove that were probably the most important were the... Um, 350, the 400, the broil, and the off. And um, can you hold it? Yes, um, like I need a microphone. Um, but I used the round little green for the 350. Then I bedazzled it for the 400. I, I never use that word. I don't <laughs> Oh my. Um then I I did a yellow for the broil. I got rid of the pink because I used pink for the off. So that that's kind of what I did there. And yeah. And you get some chocolate for that. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So Sounds like most of you grab, grasp the concept of using some different textures, some different colors, just kind of spacing it out. Just, can anyone tell me on a landline what the number five has on it? Not you, Nancy. Someone that I know hasn't been in this training or a similar training. What's on the number five on a landline? Hey, who, who has a landline? Well, your your work probably does at least, right? Right. All right. There's a little bump. Yep, we got two right answers over here. Good job. Here you go. You ready? Whoa! Wait, I am so bad. I, okay, now you know I don't do art. I do don't do tossing, ball sports. All right. Great. So very good. Is there anything you would like to add, Danny, about? the marking and the considerations to think about um, because it's individualized? Yeah, that, that's one thing is that, I mean, obviously we didn't have a consumer here, but you would want to ask the consumer. But a lot of times they don't know either exactly what's right. Um, and there is no right, but what's going to be right for them, they may not even know. I would always make sure that number five is marked and that you practice with them dialing by touch and see if they have any specific need for a particular number to be marked. Like if they have to dial nine every time at home, then you might want to put a nine. 
if everybody they call is in town and in town is always a four for the first number, you might want to mark that. Great, thank you. All right, so are you ready for your next project? Some of you have already broken into the Play-Doh, I understand that, and you may or may not like the colors at your table, um, but everybody has a pen, right? Okay, you're gonna use Play-Doh and you are going to make yourself a pen grip or a pen holder. Now, in addition to the Play-Doh, you have the right, oh look, he already did it with the twisty thing. You have the right to use any other tools that are on the table, like the wire or the twisty thing. Um, and if you need to share or mix Play-Dohs up, it's all right. Maybe don't mix the colors up crazy, but <laughs> what was that? Yeah, how bad, yeah, if someone wants to know how bad their grasp is. This is an individual task, so figure out, make yourself some type of pen holder, and then we're gonna com compare it to the commercially available. You have three to five minutes. All right, how are those? How's the Play-Doh? Does anyone else like the smell of Play-Doh, or is it just me? <laughs> I'm like, this is, it, is, it must be like a comfort memory or something, yeah. I noticed that. And I didn't even open it last night to sniff it. I, I thought about it, but I'm like, no, we'll be all right. <laughs> all right. So does anyone want to show off their creation over here? Allison? Allison is a kind of a little smart aleck, so we're going to give her the mic for a second, and she'll show you what she made. So when Laura said pen holder, I went... Well, now it's too heavy, but just a pen holder. So she wanted a pencil grip is really what she had wanted. Oh, all right. All right. But then she made a real one. Then she made a real one. All right. Anybody else want to share theirs? Hold her up. Show it off. So I basically just stabbed the pen through a wad of uh, Play-Doh and then pressed my fingers to, into the Play-Doh so it forms specifically to my hand and fingers. So. Did you get it from your Yelp Society? Uh, they kind of, some of them kind of made the same thing with their Why own finger, but well? probably not. No. All right, there's your chocolate. Yeah. All right. All right. And Mark's going to show his off now. Oh. I just took some of the shelf grip and put that around. In this case, I taped it on because that's what I had, but just something to get make a little more of a non-slip surface and a little bit bigger around. Depending on the person, you might put several layers to make it a little thicker. So that was just something with what was available. <laughs> oh. And then this is just something I made that I just wasn't quite done with, but just something, depending on how somebody needs to hold something, maybe, uh, you know, might be able to give them a different grip. Perfect. All right. He cut the scoop guard, though. That's a demerit point <laughs> right there. All right. Good. So, so he already kind of gave away a little bit of what we're looking at, but so we, on your table, there should be hopefully enough of these for everybody. Did we give them all out? Did you hand them all out? Oh, were there? Okay. All right. If you don't have one, let me know, and we will grab it. All right. So, but before you do that, let me. All right. All right. So who's got their smartphone handy? Who's got their smartphone handy? Okay. So, and if you need to get up to scan this, feel free. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a Padlet. And if you haven't done a Padlet before, basically you can scan that and it's gonna open a browser or you can download the Padlet app if you choose. 
and then you're going to be prompted to enter what you could use this for. And think about it in terms of, obviously, assistive technology. Now, Mark already gave us one tip on what it could be used for. And we're going to do this same Padlet also with the black stuff on the table later. So I want you to think about what you could use, what this could be used for in terms of assistive technology, besides holding the pen. Oh, did you get it to pull them up? Okay. As soon as everyone's done scanning, we'll pull up the actual Padlet so you can see that. And then once the Padlet comes up, there's like a little plus sign, and then that's where you hit that, and then you can add. If you have trouble, let me know. And if you don't have a smart device, you can always share with your neighbor. Are there any flip phones in the room? This might be the first. So on the screen are some of the ideas that people are coming up with for using the twisty stick. And I'll give you a few. We'll go a little bit longer and see what else we come up with. Oh, I think that is my favorite ever. Minimal space for social space. Oh, that's my new signature line. <laughs> well, I ride, um, I ride bicycle is my hobby. And um, they actually have a thing now where they're suggesting everyone use a pool noodle on the back of their bike. And it juts out to the side to visually tell drivers how far to be away from you. So that'd be like the same idea. I could just walk around with a stick. Like, <laughs> you are in my space. I, when I was in kindergarten, Mark, I was told it was a mass entry into the school, you know, like from from kindergarten through sixth grade. And, you know, I probably wasn't much smaller than I am now. And my sister that was older, she said, she's like, you stand there like this with your elbows out so that I could have space. So if I'd only had the twisty stick. All right. Hair band, a U-cuff, wrap around a cup or a can. I want to see somebody do that with a full soda. I don't know if it would hold it. Oh, look at, oh, um, you got to hold up, Mark, hold up your, uh, your cell phone holder. Look at this. Very nice. These are from his agency, so I think he's had a little practice using the twisty stick. All right, we have, oh, keep the pant leg. I found, that's another one I'm going to use because I can never find those little Velcro ones when I need them. Um, cell phone grip. And let's see, cable tie. Adaptive spoon, fidget toy. And that is probably really what they were originally purchased for, was to be a fidget toy. We use it as a cat toy at our home. The cat likes to like be beat on the head with it. 
um, bag holder, item marker. Yeah, like if you are always losing your keys around the house, if you put this right around that keychain, you are going to find that on the counter. Yeah. All right. All right. So very good. All righty. So are you on ready? Any other ideas that we didn't get up there? To open a bottle? Oh, did it work? Oh, nice. All right. Oh, she put Play-Doh on the end of it to pick up a piece of paper. This is good. And you guys can keep playing the rest of our time. So we are going to move on to our... N oh, another one. Oh, another one. Another version. Another version of a sand for your cell phone. Yeah, I like that one better, too. All right. So on your table, you have um, another tool. Actually, before we get to that one, you guys all have some wire. And we're not going to do a padlet on this, but I would like you to think about what you can make or do for assistive technology that you haven't already done yet today with the piece of wire. So you have five minutes. Go. And then you're going to share out. All right. Okay. Are we ready to report out on our wire usage? I've seen some pretty creative things as I walked around the room. So I am anxious to see what you guys will share. Anyone who wants to go first? There's still chocolate. I have a whole entire bag of chocolate. And it's summer, so it's not going to last very long. Yes, you guys have a great one. Come on up. Yeah, you both do. Yep, all three. Okay. Okay. He's in the. He's a model. All right. And in the true spirit of makerspace, this was a group project, and I will hand the. So do you want to do you want to hold it up and model it real quick? So we made a button puller. So we used the wire we wrapped it around itself a couple times to make a firm handle and then we made a loop um, that was custom fit for Jim's buttonhole size. So this is a really custom piece. And then it's just one-handed. I always found when I tried to demo a button hook that I couldn't do it because I had two hands. So then I gave one to my dad who could only use one of his hands and it was like a miracle device. So if you put one hand behind your back you might be more successful. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> uh, awesome. That's a great, did you guys get your chocolate? Yeah, yeah. You. there you go. All right. All right. Oh, look, there he got it. Woohoo! Yes. Did you think he was videotaping? Yes, we did. <laughs> and, you, and you signed the waiver. <laughs> so, yes. I'll send you the archive as soon as it's published. All right. So, who else has an idea that they would love to share that they made? That was a great one. And you can even keep that. We don't even need the materials back. Okay. Yeah, it's like a prize. Maybe I'll keep that. All right. I know I saw some other ideas out there. Anyone? Anyone? You made a rectangle. Ooh, a rectangle, but it also works as a signature guide for someone who is visually impaired. Awesome. Signature guide. I like it. Yeah. All right, Mark. What do you got for us this time? You made a coat? You wove a coat out of the... <laughs> he, he did a zipper pull. Perfect. Very good. What else can you make a zipper pull out of? Paper clip? Keychain? 
twist tie, safety pin, fishing line. Mm -hmm. If you use a paper clip and it goes through the wash enough times, that paper clip kind of degrades and then it snags on other clothes in the washing machine. True story. All right. So what are some other ideas that we had out there? Anyone else want to share what you did with the wire? S one person made a weapon, but we won't talk about that. It was just like a little poker for parking lots. <laughs> Measure, <laughs> yeah, for measuring appropriate. So, okay. so nobody else wants to share their rectangle? All right. The rectangle, their wire activity. See, I got the rectangle in my head now. All right. So we are now on to our last activity. And everyone has a black piece of material in front of them. Most of yours, if you didn't destroy it already. So this is in, so you're going to do another padlet. So before I give you the instruct, you're going to QR that. And then you're going to, it'll pull up another padlet for you to do. So throughout my career, I have um, sworn that I'm going to write a book. And that book is 101 uses for scoop guard. And I've never gotten around to it. And so I'm going to revamp that desire, and I'm going to use you all for my research. As long as, yeah, I'll credit this group, all of you, by name, individually. Yes. In really tiny print. And so this, I, you are going to do the QR, and then you are going to use the Padlet. And I want to see way more ideas than the Twisty what you can use scoop guard for. Now remember, this comes in a big roll, and I just cut and gave you a little tiny sample piece, and you can take that sample piece with you. If, because there might be some uses that you see up here, you're thinking, oh, that would be good. So, on your mark, think. All right, so we have some pretty creative thinkers in this group. Um, I'm gonna actually call couple of them up here to show what they made. So, sorry ma'am, you're up here. Becky, thank you. She, look at that, she called me right out that I couldn't remember her name. Alright, okay. <laughs> so this, let me get a hold of it for me, thanks. Sure. Um, I'm Becky. She needs both hands. I do. So I made a little purse or pill holder or a little candy holder. It matches the green and the green and a little lock. Thank you. Congratulations. She used tape. Yep, so she used tape, the stick ums, and the scoot guard, and the candy. She got pre candy because I saw it before we had her come up. All right, and we do have a little snake over there that someone used the twisty stick, the play doh, the scoot guard, and then the pen that he made. You can just hold that baby up. I know. Got to hold up. If you really want the chocolate, that way we get you on the camera. Yeah. There you go. Little, little pen holder. Good job. All right. So we, we have some good ones up here. You know, gar garlic peeler. Now that, who put garlic peeler? Okay, you need, oh, the roller thing, okay. <laughs> then it's kind of done. That's, yeah, I saw the, I saw like an infomercial on those. You put the garlic in there and then you roll it, okay. All right. I also don't cook much either, so. Um, let's see if, I'm seeing if we have any other unique ones in here. Stabilize the mattress on a box spring. A wallpaper, all right. Who said wallpaper? Oh, the garlic press. <laughs> well, I was thinking you could actually um, like sponge paint with it or something. You could do that, exactly. Um, keyboard buttons. Sew into the pants waistband to keep the pants up. Who said that one? Okay. In 
interesting. That's a good view. I've never thought of that one. I'm well on my way to my book now. Medicine bottle opener, insulate cold surfaces. And I actually did that in uh, an aluminum camper on the aluminum area. It helped reduce the cold transfer of the aluminum. Fix to baby feet to learn walking skills. All right, now who said that? <laughs> Have you done that? Have you done it? Oh. Oh, so you're going to try it. Well, I can give you a second piece if you'd like. <laughs> well, it's like the socks. It's like the non-skid socks. Okay. And just think, we all learn to walk without non-skid material. Look at that. All right. Put it on the doorknob, Contra contrast, I'm glad I saw that. So this is a big key for vision loss, is contrast. And so many times I would go out to meet with a consumer and they might have some vision loss and they're trying to, or even arthritis, and they're trying to sort their pills. And then I look over at where they're sorting their pills. Danny, do you mind standing up for just one second? And this, I like your shirt. It's not a cut on your shirt. But this, they have a tablecloth that's all floral. And they're trying to find aspirin and all these other little pills on this tablecloth or placemat. And there is no way you're going to find those. And yet, they're pretty attached to that tablecloth. They wouldn't dream of changing it. So then you bring out the scoop guard and you cut a piece and you lay it down and then they can find the pills or whatever they're trying to find. Same go contrast goes so far. So if someone's trying to, to make things in the kitchen, you might get them a set of black measuring cups and then a set of white measuring cups. And then you have white scoop guard and black scoop guard. So when they're making things, they have the contrast in order to decipher that difference. And that might make mean the difference between having a caregiver do something and them still being independent in how they do it. So I'm glad contrast was noted up there. Earring organizer. Who said that? All right, it's a good one. To hang them in there? Okay, that is a good one. I like that. All right. Insulate cold surfaces, like I said, but that could actually be like a can koozie. Nobody put can koozie up there. Stair liner, hold the technology. Window shade, that's a new one too. I'm saving this. <laughs> Overlay for a digital keyboard, okay. All right, we've got some great minds in here today. I'm happy to see that. All right. So as I said, so any other ideas you didn't get up here yet you wanna share? Yes. Oh, mm-hmm, yep, that would be great. Nancy? Yep, yeah, you can rubber band it around things that you need to have trouble, have help grip. I usually do keep one in the car um, because if there's like a bottle I need to open or even the gas cap sometimes, um, it gets too tight. And so this just gives you that extra. And then in the, like in the cold weather, my hands don't work well. so. That's the other times where I need things like this to open or turn items. All right, so I am gonna be sending out some links um, to like the tour. And then I had a couple other, I have one other video I wanted to show if it will play correctly for me. And let me come back here. Um, but there is a really good, I'm not Pinterest. I'm just gonna tell you that right now. Um, I only have an account because in my last job I had to manage a Pinterest account, so I had to learn how to do it before I messed up a organization's Pinterest account. Um, but there, I found, I'll send this link, but this was a great one. It was just some really cool and clever ideas. Um, but this is a great spot to find some creative uses for solutions for people that you are working with. And so seek out things that don't say assistive technology Look at the do-it-yourself, look at artisan, look at the makers. Um, so many things are not labeled as assistive technology, but they really are. 
And then this is one last, this is a, it was a Google event. And I think, yes, and this is a, it was a design challenge on, there we go, a walker. And then I'm, we're just, we'll just finish with that. And then your last task will be to use those post-it notes to put down one thing that you learned today that you didn't know or that you liked from today. And then we are going to collect those and we'll put them up on the wall. And it should be going. Oh, hang on. I think I still muted. Yep. I don't know if there's, I can't remember if there's dialogue. I usually walk with a walker. I can't walk without a walker. The problem occurred when I had to climb the stairs in order to get to a restroom on the upper floor and I didn't have the holder, so it was very, very difficult. They are creating a walker that I will be able to climb on stairs with nothing to hold on, just a walker. It's amazing. I can't lift, so that's why we are creating an idea that is taking a consideration of my disability in order to create the final solution. So that was an example of how makers' challenges from an industry standpoint are happening. And so it's moving beyond just the tinkerers and it is getting us to a point where we're using all of this technology to assist us with our consumer solutions.